By the time Henry Aaron broke Babe Ruth's home run record in 1974, he'd been a major leaguer for so long, 20 years, that few people remembered his baseball beginnings. In my broadcast shortly after the record breaker, I made sure to call attention to the way he started in the game, not only because it was significant to how he developed, but also because it had to do with a fascinating part of American life that for whatever reasons had disappeared. It was an appropriate time to pause and think back. Here is a tape of my report, as heard over the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the day after Henry Aaron became the number one home run hitter in history. When Henry Aaron is asked about the man whose baseball legacy he's now surpassed, he replies that he never heard of Babe Ruth until he was a grown man, and never has thought about him much until recently. Never heard of Babe Ruth? This is a hard pill for a white audience to swallow, which is, I guess, why the question keeps coming up and up. But when young Henry Aaron played ball in the cow pastures of Alabama, the stars in his eyes were Josh Gibson, Buck Henry, Cool Papa Bell, and, of course, Satchel Paige. If he could hit a ball farther than the next fellow, slide past a poised second baseman, catch a ball coming out of the sun and perform the myriad skills of baseball... Then he would grow up to play not in the major leagues, but in the Negro Leagues. Not even Jackie Robinson's spearhead into the majors when Henry was 13 years of age destroyed that dream, for who knew how well the Robinson experiment would take or how much better you had to be than Whitey to play with Whitey. Two years after Robinson reached the majors, Aaron went to work for the Indianapolis Clowns. He was a 15-year-old shortstop. The Indianapolis team, formerly called the Ethiopian Clowns, toured a great deal, and Henry learned how to sleep on a bus. Present-day apostles of black pride wouldn't have liked what they saw. The clowns were clowns, just like the name says. They threw the ball behind their backs, caught it with the wrong hand, sometimes with their hats, pretended to run into each other, used funny big bats, funny little bats, and carried on like the Harlem Globetrotters. Aaron missed by only five years the days in which the clowns would appear in the diamond in grass skirts having painted their bodies in what they took to be cannibal fashion. Like many professional athletes, they took on stage names, Selassie, Mofiki, Wahoo, and Tarzan. In Henry's last year, he played alongside a female second baseman. Miss Tony Stone drew more money than any of her male teammates and played better than some of them. No better, though, than the scrawny teenage shortstop, who even then had sad eyes and arms as thin as a lion tamer's whip. Henry Aaron had another problem, or some people thought it was a typical clown gimmick, though it wasn't. He didn't hold a baseball bat right. He batted cross-handed. Folks told him he was thwarting his full power, disrupting his timing, and taking the chance of breaking his wrists, but that's the way he'd played up to then, and it was good enough. Anyhow, it fit right in with the general clowning. He didn't actually change until he made it to the big leagues. And even then, despite fines from Milwaukee manager Charlie Grimm, he would sometimes change back when he was in a hole, no balls and two strikes. When Aaron stroke that record breaker, I had my eyes about one inch from the television set, trying to see if he'd go cross-handed when he got into a tight spot. He didn't. It probably didn't even occur to him. This was Hank Aaron the superstar, who was no longer Henry the Clown. So, despite the fact that segregated baseball was a blemish on American history, there were certain aspects of the blemish that became appealing and valuable. We've heard in these interviews about what fun the Negro Leagues were, how free, loose, and inventive the game was, how easy the communication between player and fan. And don't think for a moment that all the fans of the Negro Leagues were black. There were plenty of white baseball watchers who knew about the Kansas City Monarchs and the Baltimore Light Giants and the Homestead Grays, about Satchel and Cool Papa and Josh and the rest. One of those was a man who was to have a profound impact on the shape of the sport, including the way it was integrated. Bill Veck owned a number of franchises around the major leagues and was always considered an intelligent and innovative executive. I talked with him at his farm in Easton, Maryland. Uh, 1926, 1927, uh, I watched the uh, all the good... The Negro League clubs come into Chicago and play the Chicago American Giants. And I, of course, saw or worked, as a matter of fact, uh, most of their all-star games, Houston and Pop and so on in that vicinity. Occasionally made a trip to Kansas City when the Cubs, for whom I was then working, 
were on the road in the early 30s, uh, go over there and you could have a big Sunday selling pop to mix with something, you know, gin during the early days of pro I mean, the latter days of Prohibition, but the early 30s. So you would watch uh, the Chicago Cubs, an all-white team, for which you were working, and then you would go and uh, maybe have a good time um, watching one of the Negro ball clubs. Well, of course, it. Uh, I guess it was. A, I grew up in a ballpark. I like to see good ball players, and uh, I wasn't really uh, uh, interested in their color because there were some ball players, many ball players, as a matter of fact, in the Negro League that were certainly as good or better than anybody I would watch uh, in the National League or in the American League. And you knew that then? Well, it was quite obvious then. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when you saw their all-star team perform in Comiskey Park, the only fellow, for instance, who ever hit a ball into the center field bleachers was Josh Gibson. He hit two of them in one day. Well, I don't care if you play with nickel rockets. Uh, that's a tremendous poke. And Ruth, one that Ruth was never able to achieve. And uh, uh, it doesn't take uh, any great expertise or any great uh, experience to recognize sometimes when you're in the uh, neighborhood of greatness. And uh, and a fellow like Page or or Cool Papa Bill, uh, you know, they didn't need any any uh, credentials. You could just see, and everyone who watched him would, with any uh, degree of uh, or would watch them with any degree of honesty would would know that they could have played in the major leagues then or now or any other time well were you a particularly enlightened person or did a lot of people know a lot of white people know that the negro leagues were in some respects just as good as the major leagues well no i, I don't make that statement i don't say that they were as good i say that there were ball players playing in the negro leagues that were as good and occasionally there was a team that was better uh, than uh, a major league team. <clears throat> but I don't say that in general. I'm running the reasons being, of course, uh, that since they couldn't pay as much, they didn't draw as many people, they had more difficulty uh, keeping a completely good ball club around. They didn't have as many uh, ball players on their roster, and, and as a result... Uh, they they had to make do. A pitcher had to play somewhere else. And uh, fellas uh, in the outfield, for instance, on days he didn't pitch and this sort of thing. But their stars would have been stars in any league. In 1942, uh, I really tried to break the color line and thought I had. It lasted for about 24 hours. I had uh, worked out a deal with Jerry Nugent, who then owned what was a bankrupt ball club in Philadelphia. And uh, I went to Philadelphia. Is, you're talking about the Major League franchise? Yes, the Philadelphia Phils. They call it a Major League uh, franchise by definition, at least. <laughs> and I went to, to Philadelphia and worked a deal with them. I didn't tell him what I planned to do, nor anyone else. I had had uh, uh, Abe Saperstein and, and Doc Young, the sports head of the Chicago Defender, and Saperstein from the Harlem Globetrotters. Well, he, he, he and I had fooled together with the Harlem Globetrotters for many years. And um, kind of scouting and, and contacting the outstanding ball players, uh, then not in the service, and ones who didn't pull, look like they would be called in the service, either because of age or some other reason. So uh, I went back to Chicago to make sure that my financing was... Uh, adequate and uh, that uh, would hold still. And then I got to thinking, George Land, uh, Judge Landis, who wasn't named Mountain Kennesaw, but came from, <laughs> he came from the far uh, regions of the north, would undoubtedly make a very unfortunate statement once he learned that I had planned to sign uh, a considerable number of black ball players. Yeah. Who were these blacks? Oh, there was Josh Gibson, <laughs> there was Satchel Page. There was uh, uh, Luke Easter, fellow member Artie Wilson, uh, Roy Campanella, uh, Cool Papa Bell, who was at the end of the row, and, and Josh was, uh, as it turned out, we couldn't have signed him anyhow because he wasn't uh, alive at the time we would have 
started playing the next year. But all of the of the ball players who have been around a while in the league, not necessarily the young stars, because they would have gone in the service too. But I was looking for ones who were safe with age, but who could still play. So anyhow, I thought I'd better warn Landis, and so I stopped off at 3:33, building his office in Chicago, about four o'clock in the afternoon. As I remember, the Broadway Limited went about 5:40 then from New York. I mean, from Chicago to Philadelphia. <clears throat> and I told him what I was going to do, and he said, oh, well, you can't do a thing like that. And I said, well, you know, I thought I ought to warn you in advance. So I got on the train feeling that I had a not only a, a major league ball club, but I was almost a virtual cinch to win the pennant the next year. And uh, because this was the only really untapped reservoir of playing talent. It didn't matter to me whether they were pink with blue dots or, mm-hmm. or black. Matter of fact, I already made arrangements for a strutting band, you know. And to, wartime was a particularly propitious time to uh, to emphasize oh, the equality of black people because they were fighting and dying. Right, and you had one other thing going for it, uh, uh, and that is that uh, you could always justify this in the grounds of the shortage of manpower. Right. You see, uh, I figured I could uh, stretch that uh, considerable distance to quell some of the screams I knew would occur. And you also thought you'd get cooperation from the CIO. Yes, indeed. They had offered to uh, to finance me, but they wanted me to uh, agree uh, that uh, at no time would there be nine whites or nine blacks in the field. And I said I wouldn't tell the manager how to run his club, and I certainly wasn't going to let them. And so with my financing uh, was it out of Chicago and with Philly Cigars, which seemed to me to be a natural in Philadelphia. So in any event, I got on the, the uh, Broadway limit and feeling great. And I arrived in Philadelphia the next morning, got off, and I went to see Nugent to... Uh, we already had an agreement, uh, but to finalize and pay the money, and I suddenly discovered that the night before, by some sheer coincidence, the league had... Uh, usurped the franchise and had recalled it and had paid Nugent for it considerably less than I had offered him and that uh, immediately almost the National League then sold the franchise to a fellow named Bill Cox Mm -hmm. and their selection was very good because Judge Landis a year later threw Cox out of baseball for betting on ball games (laughs) so I, I lost the first shot at integration well, then how did you feel when uh, Branch Rickey in 1947 beat you to the punch? Uh, I, I wasn't ready, and, and uh, Mr. Rickey was, and I felt no, no uh, uh, sadness about being uh, second. I, I was only delighted that... But that's interesting. You knew when Branch Rickey brought Jackie Robinson into the National League in 1947 that though Ricky was first, you would be second? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, yes, I, I really thought I might be first. Because, you see, I, I've been singly unconvinced about Mr. Ricky's motives. Uh, Mr. Ricky, if you recall, started a, a, a black club in the Negro League in Brooklyn. And the real reason for that is that he wanted to cut in with the Giants and the Yankees, who shared equally in the proceeds of the of the Negro League games that were played in, in either the Polo Grounds or Yankee Stadium. And Ricky felt that in as much as he was in Brooklyn, that he ought to get a third of it. And the other two didn't want to give it to him. So he then said, I'll start my own club. And he signed originally Jackie Robinson, bear in mind, to the Brooklyn Negro League Club first for, as I remember, a five-year contract. Then when he found out how much money he had lost in Brooklyn the year that he operated in the Negro League, then he decided this is too expensive. But on the other hand, he has Ricky, I mean, he has Robinson on a contract. So I've never been convinced that it wasn't to save paying off the contract uh, that he didn't uh, wasn't the cause of sending uh, Jackie to uh, Montreal 
Now, I may be doing him an injustice, but having known Mr. Ricky for a good many years, I don't think so. Although uh, Ricky gave Robinson a year of seasoning in Montreal, and also uh, there was a kind of uh, a cushion period for uh, other Negro players who played for Brooklyn. You, on the other hand, when you brought Dobie into Cleveland in uh, 47 and Page uh, the, the next year, you went directly to the Negro Leagues. You, you plucked the players right out of, of their environment. Well, of course, uh, the thing that I was gambling on is that, is that the outstanding ability that Dobie showed, uh, and he was a youngster then, uh, playing for Effa Manley. In Newark. Uh, in Newark, yes. Uh, the Newark Eagles uh, was illustrative of individual ability and not the weakness of a league. In other words, by this time, uh, post-war, the, the outstanding stars uh, that had been had dominated uh, Negro League Baseball for lo these many years were getting a little older. And, of course, because of the, of the war years, there hadn't been very many youngsters coming up. It wasn't until a couple of years later that they had this great infusion of young ball players, which included Mays and, and uh, Aaron and so on. And so uh, it, their ability playing in the, in the uh, Negro League was just as good they were just as good ball players, no matter where they've been playing. They were just outstanding ball players. Yeah. So well, when Page came, I was just going to say, Bill, when you brought in 1948 Satchel Page to the Cleveland Indians, that really one would have to say was a landmark, not only in uh, baseball history but even in in American history. Well, I had been watching him pitch uh, for more than 20 years. Um, he is, in my opinion, the best pitcher that I've ever seen pitch. Uh, Leroy used to always say, uh, when they were barnstorming, he said, just give me, give me Josh, and he says, he'll hit one before the score is off me. And, and as a matter of fact, he was right. Just the, the battery, the pitcher and the catcher, that's oh. all he needed. Uh, yes. And, and, and I can remember, uh, when he was buying Storm against Fuller's team one year, and, and I happened to be in the coast, and he called me about 5 o'clock Sunday morning the day of the game. He says, I need five players for today's game. And I said, well, Leroy, what position? He says, what difference does it make? I'm pitching, and Josh is catching. So I knew that he could, that he could uh, still throw, and I knew that in the... 42 years old. Well, I, I think that he was 48 years old. Uh, as close as we could determine, he was... Born born prior to 1901, a fellow brought a uh, clipping uh, showing that he had played for the Birmingham Black Barons in 1920. Leroy Satchel Page, spelled P-A-I-G-E, yeah. and that clipping was 1920. And it, uh, I, uh, Page had said he was going to give a thousand dollars to the first guy that showed he pitched for 22. Yeah. And this fellow didn't even trust the United States mail, so he was a very wise man. And he arrived with the clipping in his hand and showed in 1920. Suddenly I discover it's my thousand dollars that Leroy's giving. So I said, well, as long as I'm in the, for a grand, I might as well find out about it. So we hired a, a firm of private investigators in Mobile. And they determined that, that they started keeping birth certificates in 1901. And that uh, Page's younger brothers and sisters were listed under the name of P-A-I-G-E. Neither he nor his older brothers and sisters were listed. And uh, that, I think, is rather uh, prima facie evidence, at least, that, uh, that um, he was born prior to 1901, which would have made him... Uh, or he could have been in the early months because I think it was the 1st of July in 1901. So he was born in either in 1900 or early 1901. So in 48, he was 48. What were the factors that went in well, to your decision to bring him to Cleveland in 48? In 47, he wired me and said, when are you going to bring me in? And I wrote him back and said, uh, it'll happen, but just let's take our time. Why? <coughs> Well, I knew that there was going to be a hue and outcry from the the traditionalists, uh, the purists, if you will, that I was making even more of a travesty of the game. 
And I didn't believe that in 46 or 7 that I had any chance to win anything. And so I didn't see any sense in, in causing a, a, a great hullabaloo uh, for no particular reason. I felt that in 48, when I brought him in, that uh, he could well be the difference between uh, winning a pennant and losing one, as it turned out he was. He had a record, I think, of 7 and 1. Night. Seven, uh, 6 and 1. 6 and 1. 6 and 1, and the one ball game he lost was uh, an, an unrun. An unearned run. And, uh, and he also uh, worked in relief and saved his couple of ball games. And since we had to play an extra game in a playoff in order to clinch it, pennant, obviously you can see that he did win the pennant for us. Mm -hmm. But then I felt I could justify uh, any attack based on the fact that he was going to be the decisive factor, and I couldn't find another pitcher of equal ability that it was available to me from any other club. So it was based largely on baseball excellence and not on uh, sociological grounds. I can tell you that I, I have no in intention uh, no willingness to pose as uh, as a defender of the downtrodden, except as it applies to me. He could do something for me that nobody else could do. And I don't care what, how he looked, what colors he was, is a matter of absolute indifference to me. His age, look, all I can tell you is they don't say, wait, you can't strike me out, you're too old. Or they can't say, look, that fastball is too good. You're black. It doesn't really matter. And it didn't matter in the slightest to me, but I saw no reason for, uh, for generating additional uh, heat. And there was heat. Don't let anybody fool you. Uh, unless, unless I could achieve something that was tremendously important to me. So it was a base uh, strictly of selfish grounds. We brought him in at the dead of night. Because if I couldn't convince my coach, I mean my manager and coaches, I didn't want to shove them down their throats and, and create uh, disharmony on a club where I thought I could win something. So Louis Boudreau was then leading the American League in batting, and he and Hank Greenberg came out, and uh, it was about 9 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, and Leroy came down from the hotel, and Abe Sapistine and I were there. And he got dressed and he did his uh, warm-up. He slowly jogged about halfway around the park, threw two, flipped two balls underhanded, and then proceeded to throw 19 straight strikes. Uh, One to, of which... To, uh, to, to a catcher. To Boudreau. Oh, to Boudreau. To Boudreau. One, one of those Boudreau hit sufficiently well so that it might, with luck, have have uh, uh, been scored as a base hit, and the other the ground, other ground ball. Uh, yes, it was ground ball, but it, it kind of trickled over. Uh, if your shortstop was was nailed to the ground, he might not have gotten there. So he dropped the bat, and Hank was going to take a few swings, and Hank watched him. He said, "Never mind, I'm convinced." Mm -hmm. And Louis says to me, "He says, look, he says, just don't let him get out of here unsigned." Alive, And I said, I have no intention of it. He said, well, uh, we don't need any more. I can use them. And I said, that's good. It was more than good. It was remarkable. Bill Vec doesn't want us to think that he ever did anything except to make money. But I don't believe him, and I don't think you should either. This doesn't mean that he would have brought in a loser. But he already knew from face-to-face -face competition that a lot of black players were better than the best the majors could offer. So what the Negro Leagues meant was that when the moment at last was right, the players were there, trained and ready, and it was therefore possible to alleviate, if not undo, the great wrong of the segregated years. That moral debt is what America owes to its black diamond.